talking about the sternum and the ribs, yes? True ribs and false ribs. True ribs connect directly with the sternum, false ribs are the rest. The last two being further considered floating ribs, because what do they not do at all? Connect anyway. No connection to the sternum, whereas like these false ones down here, they kind of connect to each other and then to the sternum. They're far less important. Okay? And feel them move around in there, all right? Because they are just basically connecting to one another with muscle holding them together. Let's go here. <coughs> I seem to recall that I talked about the pelvis, didn't I? Yeah. I finished this whole chapter? Yeah. Well, what did y'all tell me earlier then, Dad Gummit? I did the whole thing? Yes. Bless it. Oh, interosseous membranes. How important is that? Oh, man. So good. Yeah. So good. We're going to be talking. Oh, probably next. Probably next. Uh, you have interosseous membranes. I'm just going to lay this on you because it's going to matter in about two minutes. Uh, you have interosseous membranes between the bones of your arm, lower arm, and lower leg. Uh, the gist of this is that your humerus is like big and strong. Okay? And so is all this. These two bones are a lot smaller than the humerus, but they have this interosseous membrane between them that kind of links them together. It's kind of like wrapping your arm in an ace bandage. This gives you another layer of protection. The interosseous membranes are really important. So both the leg and the arm, I feel like a dance number. Oh my gosh, you don't even know. <laughs> all right, about to make some Looney Tunes references here, can they? All right. <clears throat> you got to know is that the interosseous membrane in the arm and in the leg, they're similar, but different. Okay, in the leg, the fibers are super tight. What that means is, you're, like your leg, you know, they don't twist. Like if I could get a hold of Keontae's leg and kind of give it a wrench here, most of the movement would be in your hip. All right, it ain't going to be in the lower leg. Whereas in my arm, what can I do? Oh, what kind of joint is that? It's the pivot joint. The pivot joint, and as a result of that pivot joint, it's very flexible. Okay. The fibers in that interosseous membrane in the arm are looser than the ones in the leg. And that's going to play into our conversation real quick. All right, good. I remember finishing that now. Let's go. Misleading me early on. I see how it is. We have 23 slides of simple things. We are definitely going to get done with this lecture today. All right. All right. Let's roll. So we are here. Joints. Oh my gosh, the weaknesses of the skeleton. Holy cow. Watch the sporting events. Things get rough real fast. Sites where two or more bones meet provide range of motion, the glue for the skeletal system, but are structurally weak. The joint is weaker than the bone. All right? The joint is weaker than the bone. So, oh man, let me make some terrible references. You watch somebody playing some sort of sport and somebody falls down against their leg sideways. It ain't the leg that's gonna break in most cases, all right? It's the joints, okay? The joints are structurally weaker than are the bones in most cases. Now, we classify joints in a whole variety of ways. This is a fun, I kind of enjoy these little word games. You may not like, uh, but I like them, okay? It's a fun thing to do. So, we classify joints in a few ways, and they're kind of named for what they are and what they do, all right? We're getting into that realm of things are what they say they are. We classify them based off of their structure, and then we further classify them based off of their function. Okay, structure and function. Structural classifications are the main concept that we're going to follow here. There are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. <clears throat> Where would you find a fibrous joint in the body? Yes, yeah, so louder, please. Lower arms, lower legs. That's it. Remember those, in, those interosseous membranes? Those are fibrous joints, man. That's all the two bones together using fiber. Works like a charm. Where else? Being your. What are they? Yes, the sutures in the skull. Absolutely. Those are fibrous joints. <coughs> fibrous. Holding together bones. Works like a charm. Okay? Cartilaginous joints. Ooh, now we're getting somewhere. Okay? Cartilaginous joints. Do you have cartilaginous joints in the body? And the obvious answer is yes. Yes. Where have we just been discussing the presence of cartilage holding bones to the whole? Is the ribs. That? Eh? The ribs most certainly have some cartilaginous joints. They're not the only ones, because look what else I can do, all right? Sit here and rotate like so. Let's see, let me explain something real quick. A synovial joint is free moving. This is a synovial joint, all right? It hinges. Like all this, this is all synovial joints. But this? No, that's just bone, bone, cartilage between. Those are 
carbon ash in its joints. And you'll notice that they don't really bend the way that other, you know, synovial joints bend. They just kind of have some give to them. Do you see my phrasing there? It's got give, okay? It's got a little movement to them, but not much. It's gonna matter in just a second. Uh, your uh, pubic symphysis, right here, same thing, okay? Uh, when you walk, your pubic symphysis kind of does this. Do we all see what I'm talking about? Like, can you see? Okay, right up front, right in front of the pelvis. So the two pubic bones come together at this thing called the pubic symphysis, and it is a cartilaginous joint. And as you walk, it shimmies, like this, all right? So your whole pelvis kind of shimmies around. Have we had this conversation before? All right, this dramatically softens third trimester pregnancy, it makes pelvis get real loose for obvious reasons. Yes? Right, pelvis gets real loose. Yeah. It was one of my wife's biggest complaints. She's like, it feels like my whole pelvis is going to fall apart. I don't know what's happening. I hate this. I hate this. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to get you anything in the world you want. All right? So apparently it's real loosey-goosey. And then there are synovial joints. Synovial joints are the free-moving joints of the body. All right? Synovial joints are like this right here. Okay, you got this crazy joint capsule on either side. You got that articulated cartilage between the two. And look what I can do, all right? These are all synovial joints. They're free moving. Here, I got a little give to them, all right? A little give in my lower back, you know? The uh, ye old, whatever they're called, cartilaginous joints, synovial joints. Hey, man, anything I want to do, they're easy, all right? So we further classify these by how they function. If you can't tell, all of these three joint types, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial, they behave differently. Like, do the skull bones you got, do they flex around much? No, they don't, all right? So we have terms for this. The terms are synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. Synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. Now, first time, uh, comment. Anytime you see S-Y-N as a root, like synarthrosis, these, these words mean exactly what it sounds like they mean. Synarthrotic means syn for synthesis, that means togetherness. All right, if you break down your Latin, it's Latin. Mm -hmm. That means togetherness. Okay, so synarthrosis, it's a joint arthrotic, like uh, arthroscopic surgeons work on joints. Yes? Okay, synarthrotic it is a joint which is together. These are non moving. Does that make sense? The synarthrosis doesn't move. It's fixed. Your skull bones, do they move? Mm -hmm. They're still no <clears throat> Next are amphiarthroses. Amphiarthrotic means slightly movable. I like to consider this that they have <clears throat> a little give, all right? They don't do this, okay? They bend, they got a little bend to them. My back, man, hey. Those uh, verte vertebrae, oh my gosh. Yeah. I was gonna say that vertebral their, discs and vertebrae. vertebrae. Mix the nose together. Like Mr. Hopper, he enunciates things in the weirdest ways. Anatomy too is gonna be fun for you guys. All right, your vertebrae or your vertebral discs, depending on if you can mix those two words together or not in your own brain. Uh, they don't really articulate, they, they give. You know, they give a little bit. Like I got, you know, there's a little flexibility in there, a little bit. And then there are diarthrotic joints. Diarthrotic joints are really movable. Synovial. All synovial are diarthrotic. They're the only diarthrotic joints. Synovial joints are diarthrotic joints. <laughs> That's how this works. All right, good, good times, good times. Let's go here. Oh, man, yeah, we've already played this game, so I'll play it again. Uh, you have, or you had, uh, probably a better way to put it, Fontenelle. You had fontanelles. What are fontanelles? We call them tongue spots. Mm -hmm. And I believe we've talked at length about them before, have we not? Mm -hmm. So the soft spots in the skull, these are uh, very visible. They're visible. Like kids got no hair, you can see them easy. They're indentations. <laughs> and at least one of my kids, because I remember this distinctively, when her heart would beat, you could see it kind of moving around a little bit. It was a weird, what a weird thing to see. I remember my other kids being like, Iris, my daughter. Very inquisitive. I'm like, don't touch. It's fine. Don't mess. Everything's okay. Don't stress. Uh, so yes, indeed, you had fontanelles. These are the soft spots in the skull. And again, they assist with the birthing process. Very important for us. This is why we sort of have a cutoff range, if you will, for um, 
how long we let people go before that kid, even regardless of the kid's size, right? There's a time period where we want that kid out of there because we don't want the skeleton hardening up inside. Uh, now, the skull starts out with two frontal bones. Put those fused real quick, all right? Real quick, frontal bones fused. And the skull will reach its adult size by the time you're about eight or nine years old, which is why you see little kids, cute as they are, that's my girl, okay, mm. she's six now, <laughs> my gosh, what a snuggly little lady. Um, this here, you can see her head is just a massive gourd, sitting so on <laughs> these tiny little shoulders. Like, look at your head compared to this head on this body. It's very different. Can we agree? Yes. Head reaches adult size by the time you're eight or nine years old. Uh, and that is to say that it grows very quickly early, okay? Which is one of the reasons kids struggle to walk, because they're one, trying to figure out how to walk, and two, their top to bottom balance is different than yours, okay? It's different. Whereas if you look at a full grown adult, like this fella here, even though he's one of the smartest humans that's ever lived, his head looks relatively normal on his shoulders. Who is that? Neil deGrasse Tyson. That is Neil freaking deGrasse Tyson. And he's a freaking genius, man. Amazing. If you don't know, you get on some YouTube, Watch Neil deGrasse Tyson talk, you'll walk away better informed about life. Deal? Astrophysicist. The guy ain't dumb. Amazing. Uh, I think, oh dude, I don't know. It was either him or Michio Kaku built a um, electronic accelerator in his garage for a science project. And whenever it kind of came out that he melted down the power grid in his whole neighborhood, <laughs> they just took him out of school and put him right into college. <laughs> That's Smart cool. fellas. All right, let's go here. It's one of the two, I forget which. Uh, <clears throat> man, no I, I can have, we can have a conversation on which pose this crosses the class right now. Watch this TV show. Yes, he had a TV show, Hush Hush, that's a little bit easy. I built off of his mentor's uh, show, Cosmos, the Boom Was. Yes, it was. Oh, you can get this. All right, let's go here. Fibrous joints. <clears throat> now, in the realm of fibrous joints, there's a few types. Okay, listen up. In the realm of fibrous joints, there are a few types, and I have them labeled here. There are sutures, syndesmoses, and gomposes. Okay, sutures, syndesmosis, and gomposes. Uh, we'll do sutures first. Sutures, let me make sure I'm not jumping ahead. Yeah, we're good. Sutures are fibrous joints. Like in the skull, they're sutures. Yeah, hold bones together. So the idea here is, when these bones are growing together via interosseous membrane formation, okay, so uh, in, in the membrane, just remember this uh, ossification, uh, the bones will grow together, and when they meet, they, they form up tiny little short ligaments, little bitty ligaments, little fibers, fibers joint, right? Tiny little short ligaments that interlace these bones together and make them non-moving. Because they're non-moving, we call them there are bones. See where this comes from? Mm -hmm. So, what kind of joints are your skull bones? Your skull bones are a suture, a fibrous joint. But what do you classify them in terms of their movement? They are synarthrotic. They don't move. You see how we use the terms now? So I'll lay this on you one more time. Your skull bones are held together with fibers, so we call them fibrous joints. But specifically, we refer to it as a suture because they are tiny little short ligaments short ligaments holding them together. And as a result of this, the skull bones do not move. There is no articulation. We consider them synarthrotic. Because syn means what? Together. Togetherness. They don't move. That's great. Next. Yeah, yeah, let's just go. Let's go. There's a conversation to be had there, and I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to do it to you. Talk about how we age skeletons, but I'm not going to do it. I'm sort of feeling the urge to have long conversations about things that are fun but not important today. I'm not going to do it. I know my own weaknesses. <laughs> Number two, fibrous joints, the syndesmosis. Okay, syndesmosis. <clears throat> Here we have two bones that are held together with ligaments, shortage fiber. Fibers are longer longer fibers in a syndesmosis. The class of syndesmoses are those between the radius and the ulna, and those between the tibia and the fibula. Okay? Tibia and fibula. Okay. 
here I am struggling to tell you why the fibula is called a fibula. Just we had that conversation, didn't we? I no. no tell no, us. You wait. Yeah, tell us. Oh, okay, yeah, we're talking about it in the lab anyway. imagine the old toga all right but real ones not modern day ones where you're having a good time all right togas back in the day what's a toga uh, like yeah like that's good thing. think about like a, a roman walking into the senate right the classic toga yes everybody yes. with me so what you would hold the toga on with was a type of brooch and this thing that sort of fastened it all together everybody with me on this and it was held together with a pin for the brooch. And the pin for the brooch was called a fibula, okay? So this is supposed to look like the pin that would have been used to hold the brooch in place, but much larger. Oh. So it looks like a pin, a big, huge one. Pointy on one end, dull on the other, pin, fibula. So the joint, the joint between the tibia and fibula is a fibrous joint. Fibers are a little bit longer. They're not itty bitty ones like a tissue. So we call these syndesmoses. And in almost every case, these are going to be uh, cerebrosis. Now, you could kind of consider uh, the radius and the ulna antiarthrotic. Most of the movement here takes place in the wrist and back here at the arm. The interosseous membrane just kind of <clears throat> has a little give to it. See where I'm coming from? So it's Generally considered, again, in the lower leg and the arm, generally considered center arthrotic, but there's a little give in the arm, so we might consider that. Take home message this is a fibrous joint, it's called a syndesmosis. Fair enough? Last but not least, gomphosis. <coughs> the gomphosis. <clears throat> uh, gomphosis means uh, to nail in Greek. To nail. So a gomphosis is supposed to look like a hole in wood with a nail in it. What this is, is the area where the teeth connect to the jaw, right? It's gomphosis. So your teeth are held to your jaw with ligaments. There's ligaments that hold them in. Have you ever had a tooth pulled or remember the, the feeling of pulling one of your own teeth? The sensation is that of cracking. Yes, a weird, snappy, cracky sound. All right, what that is, is the ligaments of the teeth breaking as it's being yanked out of your head or as you're yanking your own tooth out of your head. Weird popping sounds, all right? And I, ooh, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. My daughter, okay, she's six, loses her teeth right now. Deciduous teeth, yes. And like I'm sitting there and I see her like wiggling the one and I'm like. <laughs> slam the door when she's got her eyes closed. Whoo! Comes right out. I mean, it was coming out. It was on the way, you know. It just needed like a little final push. But she's like, pow! She goes, mommy, it slipped off! It came out! The tooth is gone! I was like, oh! <laughs> Never watching this again. My wife's like, oh! <laughs> mm, that's going to be freaky to watch. Yeah. Again, they got little bitty ligaments to hold them in place, and that's uh, good and bad, I suppose. <clears throat> there are conditions where if you don't take good care of your teeth, they start to fall out. Uh, called periodontitis. Periodontitis. These are called periodontal ligaments. 
either the ligaments that hold in the teeth, dental, yes, that's an orthodontal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, periodontal ligaments, so periodontitis is when these get inflamed, they start to fall apart, basically, so the teeth fall out of the head. And you don't want that, I promise. You want to keep your teeth. A lot easier to keep what you got as opposed to having new ones put in. Oh, let me just tell you about a little bit of a rub on this conversation. Take as good care of your teeth as is physically possible. There is really strong evidence, and we don't know why this is, all right? We don't know why, but this is true. Uh, where if you have sort of constant tooth issues from lack of maintenance, basically, uh, that it causes a direct route to heart disease, like um, heart attacks, strokes, uh, what do you call it? You know, heart suppressant fluid, uh, congestive heart failure, like all that, boy, like probably a 30, 40% increase if you have tooth issues. So we think it's probably some of the inflammatory chemicals that are released in the oral cavity when you have tooth issues. So get them taken care of quickly because you don't want to end up with heart issues. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Like wash your teeth. Wash your teeth, right? <laughs> it's going to happen for a whole variety of reasons. What I'm saying is. <laughs> what we got next? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that'll do. So they're not they don't move. And again, the teeth are alive, okay? You gotta realize the teeth are alive. Uh, they, they have this pulp inside of them, which is a living material, and it helps to maintain the dentin, which is what the uh, inner surface of the tooth is made of. <clears throat> it's very bone-like, but not bone. Uh, they lack osteoblastic cells, and osteocytes, they, they lack bone cells. Uh, so as a side effect of that, if you crack a tooth, does it heal? The answer is mm -hmm. no. Okay, which is real pain. You want to, you know, make a lot of money, figure out a way to inject some stem cells into there that are laced with some sort of crazy CRISPR enzymes or something like that, and teach them how to make bone back out of a tooth. You could be real rich, Grandstead. I'm just going to start, you know, I don't know, growing teeth. Let's think Mr. Hopper do what he says. Growing teeth. <laughs> there you go, growing teeth. I'm sure no one would think like you were doing something weird there. Hey, moving on. <laughs> All right, cartilaginous <laughs> joints. Uh, where am I at? Yeah, okay. So there are two types of cartilaginous joints, synchondroses and symphyses. Yes, yeah, we're doing it all one slide. Synchondrosis and a symphysis. Uh, the nature of this is as follows, and now here's the take home message. People screw this up on tests every year. Don't do that first, all right? A synchondrosis is hyaline cartilage based exclusively. A synthesis has fiber cartilage. All right? Synchondrosis, hyaline cartilage exclusive. Synthesis has fiber cartilage. That's the key, key difference here. All right? Now let's talk about what that means for us. Uh, a synchondrosis is where there's hyaline cartilage connecting bones together. And these are almost exclusively connect, uh, considered synarthrotic. They don't move, okay, they don't move. Now, the classic place where you have hyaline cartilage connecting two bones, and now pay attention team, we're not talking about articular cartilage here, we're talking about bone, hyaline cartilage, bone together, okay? Right there. What are these? The growth plate, yes indeed, a epiphyseal plate. Your epiphyseal plates are the classic synchondrosis. It's where there's a bone holding together to another piece of bone with cartilage between the two. That's a growth plate, that's how this works. And another really good place to see this is in the ribs, okay? Uh, it's, there are complicated reasons behind what I'm about to say, but generally considered the top rib only, okay? Your upper ribs exclusive uh, are bone to cartilage to bone would be the rib to the cartilage to the sternum, okay? And they are generally, again, synarthrotic. They don't move. They don't move. <clears throat> and again, there, there's reasons behind these statements. Don't worry about the nuances. Just believe what I'm telling you. I'm not going to go into the details. Moving on. Synthesis. <clears throat> what do I call that part of the pelvis down there? Louder. The pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis. A symphysis is an area where you have bone 
to other foam, but with fiber cartilage in place, all right? That is a symphysis, and it's literally called a symphysis. It's the pubic symphysis, okay? Because guess what the two bones it connects are called? The pubic bones. Now you know, all right? So the pubic symphysis, as you can see here, uh, this is gonna be where there is hyaline cartilage normally. There's a little bit of hyaline cartilage, but with uh, fiber cartilage really being the main bit there. Okay, there will be fiber cartilage in play. And a symphysis tends to be anti-arthritic. They tend to have a little bit of give to them. A really nice place to look at a symphysis is in the spinal column, all right? In the spinal column. Your intervertebral discs are made out of fiber cartilage. As a result of your intervertebral discs being made out of fiber cartilage, bone and bone using cartilage, your fiber cartilage in play, that makes your intervertebral discs a symphysis type of cartilage. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with that. So these are joints held together with the cartilage. Sicadrosis, hyaline, symphysis, fibro. That's what we have. Well, that's how this works. Okay. Questions? All right, we're about to change gears here, team. Let's talk about synovial joints. Uh, synovial joints where the rubber meets the road. They are really, really nice. These are set up for free movement. These are the joints you use to walk around and do the things that you do on a daily basis. Synovial joints are vastly more movable. They have vastly more movement. They are diarthrotic. They're free moving is what diarthrotic means. Uh, and as a result of this, synovial joints are a lot more complicated. They're just a lot more happy. You need to know the parts of a synovial joint, all right? They're all the same. You need another part. So here we go. Ah, uh, synovial joints have all of these attributes and may have these attributes. May have these, all have these. So let's talk about what they all have and we'll talk about what some have. <clears throat> all have articular cartilage. Well, as long as you're not, you know, aged. So the older you get, the less cartilage you have, yes? Yes. You've heard of osteoarthritis? Yes? Mm -hmm. That's when you don't have cartilage anymore. And you don't want that. We're talking about healthy joints here. So they all got articulating cartilage. So where is this in the body? That's a shoulder. shoulder. You better believe it. Can you see the white line through here? Yes. And then another white line through here? Mm -hmm. That's cartilage. <coughs> cartilage on the shoulder blade here, cartilage on the humerus there. You've got these two connecting together but there are articulating pieces of cartilage, hyaline cartilage covering the opposite ends of the long bone. Like here, look, there's cartilage on that piece of bone, cartilage on that piece of bone, and then they'll be capable of moving against one another. What you gotta realize is this cartilage forms an ultra smooth surface, all right? The cartilage forms an ultra smooth surface. So these bones can kinda rub on one another with very little friction. Doesn't that make sense? Okay, if you got bone to bone, it's like two rocks. You don't want that, okay? They have these ultra smooth surfaces so they can glide past one another very easily. Articulating cartilage. Two, synovial cavity. Can you see the opening between the two here? Look here, see the opening? It's open space. There's a synovial cavity. A space inside of there, an open space, a cavity. There's an open cavity within your synovial joints. Three. An articulating capsule. The capsule has an outer fibrous membrane and an inner synovial membrane. What kind of joint is this? What kind of membrane is on the inside? The outer. A synovial membrane. And guess what kind of fluid it makes? Shall we do this one more time? What kind of joint is this? It's a synovial joint. What kind of membrane is on the inside of it? A synovial membrane. What kind of fluid must it make? This cavity is not air filled, it's filled with fluid. That fluid is synovial fluid. Somebody made me happy. What would the synovial fluid be doing here? It's a freaking form of lubrication, man. You've got this ultra smooth surface made out of cartilage. You've got a surface lubricated with synovial fluid. It makes for very little to no friction when your joints are moving. Duh, makes perfect sense. This is how this works. And it's even deeper than you think, okay? 
this goes deeper than you think. For instance, I'm going to make sure I'm not skipping around. There are also ligaments here, and ligaments hold things together. What are ligaments? They connect bone to bone. What are tendons by comparison? Muscles. Muscle. Tendons are muscle bone, ligaments are bone to bone. Get that out of the way. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how these joints work. You see my sponge here? This system is referred to as weeping lubrication. Uh, you ever heard anybody say that you're taller when you wake up than you are when you go to sleep? Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's totally factual. Uh, did you know that when astronauts are in space for prolonged periods of time, they can grow by inches? Yes. All right, like uh, you may not be aware, but I'll tell you, there was a recent experiment done where they had an astronaut that was a twin. Okay, he had an identical twin. So they take all these crazy measurements from these two dudes that have been living on planet Earth for 35 years or something like that. I don't know how they work. But uh, they take all these measurements and they send one of them up in space for a full year. They're prepping for Mars is what they're doing. Okay, they want to see the effects of being in space for a long, long time. Uh, and the only way you can really have a controlled experiment is by having an identical twin. Genius. Okay. Dude is like two inches taller than his brother now. Is what? Permanently or? Um, no, probably not. It'll probably go back to normal after a period of time. Why would you be taller after you wake up in the morning? Less, Why would you be taller after being in space? Less stress on your spine and your discs. Nobody Let me tell you about something else you might notice when you wake up in the morning, especially as you get older. You wake up and you're like, Oh, why are you so stiff? Oh, what's happening? And after a little bit of time, you kind of loosen up. Or alternatively, you may realize that before you do some sort of athletic activity, you really stretch out. You sit down and kind of try to grab the feet. Yes? Yes. A little bit of this action before you lecture in the morning. <clears throat> All right? A little pop. <laughs> Something. So the idea here is as follows. Uh, your synovial joints. Your synovial joints pointing at right now. Uh, the cavity will fill with fluid. It will fill with fluid. And then as you are walking around doing the things that you do, that fluid slowly weeps into the surrounding membrane. It's forced. It's forced into the surrounding membrane. And the idea is that when I lift my leg up, this synovial joint fills with fluid. It, it, it goes into the joint cavity. Like there's a negative pressure to suck the fluid into the cavity. Pay attention, this is really important, all right? Then when I put the pressure on the knee, it goes like that. It goes back into the membrane with the pressure of my body on that knee. And then this one's full of fluid. And I put another step down, and it's like a shock absorber in your car. Take the pressure off. The idea here is it's absorbing some of the energy from the movements that you do, preventing it from going directly into the cartilage, preventing you from having damage to your joints. And we're talking not just the knees here, team, every synovial joint in your body, all right? Every synovial joint in your body does this. And the collective work of this is to give your joints longevity, okay? Yo. Okay, so that's so possible that you need like replacement? Like a knee replacement? So it wouldn't do the same. Because you just got uh, polymers, high-tech polymers in there doing the work. Uh, but it wouldn't matter too much because this stuff's super tough compared to cartilage and bone. Like we're talking organic. Yeah, like uh, titanium and like space-age polymers are a little stronger than bone. But I would say that your bones are a little better. Like we're pretty damn good at doing replacements these days. But, you know, people are modest. So it's uh, modern polymers, like, you know, what makes that door open and close? Mm -hmm. Granted, it needs a little fancier than that door, but you get my point. Um, oh, hell, one more, one more little story. I, man, I twisted my ankle one time. Twisted is a weird way to state it. I overextended my ankle once. Like, I've got naturally strong ankles. Like, I know folks, my dad has weak ankles. Like, he used to destroy his ankles playing football. And back in the 60s, Take me out there. They didn't take as good a care of them as they did today. Like, here, have a cortisone shot. You'll be fine. Go play.
bad boobs. All right, uh, I have strong ankles. I've never really done any kind of damage to them. I've done a lot of dumb things in my life, all right? A lot of dumb things I have done. Uh, but I've only twisted it or overextended it one time. And this was only a few years back. Uh, we were at my house in North Carolina, getting ready to move back to Alabama. And we were loading up an old car I had at the time. And my dad's like, oh man, we need a ratchet strap to hold this thing down. I was like, ooh, let me go get it. So I go running across my yard. I did. I forgot that I had a hole where it used to be a tree and it was flat grass now. You know, I made it look nice, but it was still a hole in the ground. And I stepped in it. So you can imagine my foot coming down and instead of getting flat ground, it finds a hole. It just goes like that. So like, you know, it really, you know, really upends my foot. And boy, I hit the ground. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Oh no. So I get up and I'm like, Oh, we're good. This is fine. We're good. All right. So let's work and scrap this truck out of our car. Right so I go and I get the thing, you know, we take care of it. But then, like I distinctly remember, Kathy, that night, I'm laying in bed. And having the cover, well, if you're laying like this, and having the cover on top of my foot, it was hurting. It was hurting, so I'd have to lay sideways to keep the foot sideways. What's going on here? And then the morning comes, okay? Mm -hmm. Throw the covers off, sit up in bed. Oh, now I gotta get short again. Sit up in bed, and when my feet touch, I was like, wow, I can't touch the ground with that foot without wanting to Die. scream in terror. Okay. I got you, you know, you see these movies where people are like, oh, I can't, can't walk at all. I was always like, hurt that bad. It was real bad. So I remember distinctly rolling off the bed and crawling to the bathroom to get myself ready for the day and telling my wife, I'm like, you got to go to, you know, Walmart. You got to get me a cane. We got to move today. Like I got to drive nine hours. I need a cane so I can get around. So she goes and gets me a cane. By the time she gets back, I can walk. Okay. Because as I'm working this thing, I'm starting to get a little bit, you know, a little better and a little better. And then after a little while, I got a little, you know, hobble. I'm hobbling around. But I'm okay, you know? Why would it hurt so bad at first? It didn't get better as I used it. Why would you say? It was full of fluid, right? Fluid. Louder. It was full of fluid. It was full of fluid. That's not the fluid at the end of the day. When you have an inflammation like that, it's excess production. Your joints are like, you dummy. We have to take care of this ourselves. So they make excess fluid to protect it. And then as, as you use it a little bit, it'll work that fluid back where it's supposed to be and the joint will loosen up and then it feels better, all right? It works like a charm. That is as classic of a synovial joint issue as any, okay? The synovial joints fill with fluid in the morning you're stiff. So you use them a little bit, that fluid kind of gets where it needs to be and it works like a system of lubrication in your engine, man. Kind of let things flow smoothly past one another as long as the fluid's there, as long as the cartilage is there, things are nice and easy. Work with a shock absorber, keeps your system functional. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, the classic edemas, there can be a variety of reasons for this disease. All right, a variety of reasons. You can have all sorts of other damage that produces this disease and uh, causes a localized buildup of fluid. Even minor lymphatic issues, like you could damage a lymphatic vessel and it'll build up fluid like it's going down a style. We're talking in the capsule itself. Mm. All right. Um, yeah, 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 it'll do. Just for kicks and giggles, what would you call her job description? Professional She's a contortionist. Pretzel. Yes. A professional wrestler? Is there a pretzel? Pretzel. <laughs> Boy, that's how I was going. I was like, no, 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 she'd get hurt real bad. All right. Uh, now, some of these joints have other things as well. Like some of these joints have menisci. Where do you find meniscus? Your, your knees. knees. Your knees are snowgill joints. They have intervening pads and fiber cartilage. Like you can see it right here. You can see it right here. That. See the pad? Right. That's meniscus. That's what meniscus looks like right there. There's these little cups where the femur fits against the tibia. Huh. Put these little cups. So that's what meniscus looks like. Uh, if you carry your meniscus, what might the doctor do? Yeah, well, that's true. Give me a little more detail than that, please. Yeah, that's good. That's 
look at it, give it some juice, and then scoop it out. Do they take it out? Or just leave it be? It's a mess. You don't have to have it. What it does is it helps support the joint next to stronger. Uh, these days, I think we're replacing it with yet more state based polymers. Yeah, well, they don't have to. It's like if your sister was a quarterback from the Niners or something like that, they'd have probably done more. Does that make sense? This is, you know, again, if, if I break my leg, I'm getting a plaster cast, but it's, you know, one of these pro athletes breaks a leg, they're getting a fancy ultrasound based 3D printed cast. Is that fair? It's our life. So, so what happened when you lost the family? I can think of that. I mean, get that ligament on the back. Stretchy, stretchy, damage. What's fibers in there, man? It's hot. Hopefully not too much. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have more time, but I totally killed a whole bunch. Talk about that. All right, here we go. Mercy and tendon sheets. So, how deep am I? Like eight slides, five slides? Nine. Hey, we're doing good. Oh, All right. <clears throat> Mercy and tendon sheets. A tendon sheath is a bursa. A bursa is a tendon sheath. They just do slightly different things. They're the same. They just do slightly different things. A bursa is a bag of synovial fluid. It works like a ball bearing. Anywhere there's a joint system where the joint's got a lot of movement to it, where there's a lot of bones that do a lot of, you know, rubbing against one another, you're going to have bursae. You're going to have tendon sheets. So the bursa, again, is like a little ball bearing that sits inside of the joint, kind of helps hold things apart. And as you squeeze the bursa, it will weep out a little bit of snowgill fluid, lubricating the area. Works like a charm. Okay, bursi, they work like a charm uh, in terms of keeping things moving. Like your knees, did I have a number? Okay, look, don't quote me on this, but I swear I remember reading somewhere there's something like 16 bursi in each knee. Like of varying sizes, there are like 16 bursal sacs in each knee. You may have heard of bursitis, yes? Mm -hmm. All right, that's an inflammation of your bursa. Uh, and again, these are filled with synovial fluid. And Keontae, here we go again. I'll tell you another long story. Uh, when I was probably nine or 10, maybe 12, I was young. Okay, I was young. I was in Chook County, Alabama, and my brother was playing high school baseball. So I had nothing to do uh, except screw around and injure myself. <laughs> That's just my way. Uh, yeah, fancy deep. So me and some buddy, buddies of mine were crawling up on the bleachers, you know, get on the back. And it's all this, you know, framework. See, this climate, you know, as you do. I was terrified if my kids were doing this today, but at the time, my parents didn't even care where we were. Oh, it's in the 90s. <sighs> Moving on. Um, I'm climbing up this thing in the trash can. I don't know why, but they were all French Deco. They had these weird spikes sticking off of them. I don't know. And I ran my knee, ow, right into one of the spikes on this trash can. As I'm climbing, and like I, I fell down. I, you know, I, I let go and I hit the ground, and I'm like, oh, you know, as you do. And I look down, and I punctured my knee. You know, I had a little spike in it, and there's a little bit of blood. Like I could see a little blood, but the predominance of the fluid leaking out was clear. I had not had anatomy and physiology yet. I didn't know what was going on. I just remember being like. Normal. It's supposed to be blood coming out of your body. Mine is clear. Not good. So fortunately, I had probably eaten a hot dog or something, and I had a paper towel, napkin, stuff in my pocket, so I took it out, cleaned it up, and held pressure on it, let it stop, you know, doing whatever the heck it was it was doing. And my buddy's like, "You okay?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm fine. Just go about your business. Everything's okay here." What had I done? I punctured a bursar. Absolutely. Maybe they're right on the skin. Fill your knees. Look at those weird little cushy, gushy spots. Those are bursy, man. They're, they're sitting on their surface. It's like a little tiny water balloon, but not water. Snow balloon. And they work on ball bearings, kind of keeping things separated and doing what they do. It's the same story for a tendon sheath. A tendon sheath is just a bursa that wraps itself around a tendon. A uh, classic place to look for these is in the, the lower arms. All right, so where are the muscles that run your fingers? way down there, all right? If you grab this and run your fingers, you could feel all those muscles just going haywire. And they all go through a tiny little spot in your wrist called your carpal tunnel. Some of you are more familiar with your carpal tunnel than others. It looks like this, you see it? Right, see what I'm talking about? 
all those tendons, they run right through there. Uh, and as we, as a result of that, those tendons get a lot of friction, or at least they would, because they are now wrapped in tendon sheaths. Every time they try to move against one another, they just weep out lubrication, and it keeps things from going to friction and causes damage. Now, can you still damage the tendons going through your carpal tunnel? The answer is yes. What do we call that? Times are changing. This used to be considered the, the common secretary's disorder called carpal tunnel syndrome. I, my, my mother, you know, typed for 30 years working for the state uh, on old school typewriters, you know, where you gotta really shove them down and right? you're really pushing those buttons. And uh, she has big scars down each hand right through here because they had to go in and release tension off of her carpal tunnel. It's called carpal tunnel syndrome. Anybody ever heard of this? Mm -hmm. Carpal tunnel syndrome. When you're doing repetitive hand motions, you didn't end up with carpal tunnel syndrome. Ah, oh, good slide. Good slide. This is a good slide. Uh, let's talk about range of motion and joint stability, shall we? These are what we call inversely proportional. Can anybody tell me what that means? Keep up your scientific parlance. If something's inversely proportional, as one goes up, the other goes down. Yes, that's exactly right. So the more stable your joints are, the less range of motion you have. But the more range of motion you have, the less stable your joints are. Does that make sense? Let's think about some examples, shall we? Now, there are three things that determine joint stability and range of motion. Those are the shape of the articulating surface, the ligaments involved, and the tightness therein, and muscle tone. Okay, muscle tone certainly plays a role here. Shape of the articular surface. Here's your shoulder. Classic dislocated shoulder. See how flat the glenoid cla uh, cavity is here on the scapula? Mm -hmm. And then look at the uh, look at the ball from the humerus. Oh man, totally different animals. Round ball of the humerus, flat concavity on the glenoid cavity. These don't meet up real tight. And as a side effect of that, what do you hear about people doing all the freaking time? Dislocating your shoulders. Because of the shape of the articulating surface, those joints are not terribly stable. All right? They're not terribly stable. But what do you know about their range of motion? Oh, some of the most in the body. All right? Incredibly high range of motion. Lack stability, high range of motion. Here I am you know, killing too much time today, I think. Every slide. But I gotta tell you about Master Coker. Holy cow. You gotta know about Master let me tell you a little about Master Coker, all right? Master Coker was a fourth or fifth degree Yoshikai black belt. And you know, you run into people sometimes, they're like, yeah, I've got a black belt. And you're like, I bet you do. All right? You would not have questioned this man. You would not have, you just knew. Like you shake his hand, this big mitt just wraps around yours, and it's, his fingers are three times the size of yours. And you're like, <laughs> Okay, I believe you. I'm not going to question this. But then you learn a little bit about Yoshikai martial arts. You realize these guys don't screw around. Like I've, I've watched it breaking, um, what do you call them, um, wooden baseball bats with his legs. Whoa, right through three of them. You're like, okay. I wonder what that would do to a human leg. Probably a lot of damage if I had to guess. You know what a 50 pound hanging bag is? Like a yes. big punching bag? Okay, big punching bag, like you can ooh, shove it and like, you know, get it swinging. I watch Master Coker come across and kick a 50 pound hanging bag and it goes up and goes, boom, it hits the ceiling and comes back down. You're just like, I wouldn't cross this 50 year old man. Wonder what he's like when he's 35. And the answer is terrifying. He was like, yeah, I spent five years in Japan. You know, it took off, I was tired of, you know, what we're doing here, took off, went to Japan. Did, did five years of full contact, you know, made good money. I was like, what, what, wait, what? He said, like, yeah, it was me and five other guys. We'd be in a tiny room, you know, like no beds, no nothing. We'd sleep on the floor. And at night, you know, no entertainment, maybe a radio. We'd just sit around and have buckets of rice. And we would just punch the buckets of rice to make our knuckle, knuckles tough. I was like, this is a real human being. Here he is. Here's <laughs> Master Coker. 
I was like, Master Coke, you had to get hurt real bad. I have to do this rice bear, crunching. Bear with me. Right. It's like, Master Coke, you had to get hurt real bad doing that. Like, that sounds terrifying. It's like, tell me about a time you got hurt real bad. He's like, yeah, I got my shit, my hip tweaked one time. This guy hits me in the hip and just locks the whole back of thing up, and I'm pretty much one legged. I was like, well, what'd you do? And he goes, well, we we're in tournament. I need the money. I wasn't dropping out. It's like, so what did you do? He goes, well, I was bigger than one. So when they'd say fight, I'd just grab the other guy and twist one of his shoulders out of socket. Then he'd have one arm and I'd have one leg and it was an easy fight. It's like, okay, this man just nonchalant dropped to me that he could twist another person's shoulder out of socket with his hands. With no problem. And I don't doubt it. I believe him. The shoulders have a lot of range of motion. But what's the side effect of that? They lack stability. So All right, basically, so that's how this works. Now compare this to the elbow. So you met the protagonist of this particular TV show, I see. <laughs> moving on. All right, so <laughs> moving on. Um, elbows don't come out of socket unless you do something real bad, okay? Unless you do something real bad because the shape of your articulating surface is like freaking deep, okay? They got a real deep articular surface. To dislocate an elbow, you got to do something pretty bad, all right? And that's going to involve a lot of damage. Whereas if you tear your shoulder out of socket, I mean, I wouldn't do it, but I could put it back in, no problem. Okay, for those of you that aren't aware, not that I would ever recommend you do this for anybody you know, take them to a doctor's office, but all you gotta do is pop a shoulder back in place, take it, grab a hold, kind of give it a little pull. Oh, don't do like in the movies, it ain't mm -hmm. the same. You don't go snap, no. give it a little pull, pull it in to the side of the chest here, and just come around with it, and it'll go right back in. And complete mm -hmm. the circle. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, ligaments. The more you got, the stronger it is, the tighter they are, the less range of motion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Bunch of tight ligaments. Hey man, you got no stability, or sorry, you got lots of stability, but very little range of motion. And this is all genetics, random genetics. Whereas if you have a pretty bad gum loose ligamentation, uh, you will have far more range of motion, but less <laughs> joint stability. Like, look at this lady here. What do you think about her ligamentation? Loose or tight? Loose. Real freaking loose. And as a side effect of that, she probably dislocates joints every now and again. Whereas someone who has very tight ligamentation will have more stability, but will have less flexibility. And this is a lot of genetics. A lot of genetics. Uh, the gym where I was working out, I remember distinctly, there's this, okay, look, I am not flexible. I'm the opposite of whatever flexible is, okay? I know my body form, I lack flexibility. This is where you say, you just need to stretch more. No, that ain't the way it works. I have tried <laughs> in my life. I've been in really great shape and had no flexibility. Like for me being able to touch my toes, I'm like, whoa, whoa I'm doing something, okay? Like, I'm really getting there, oh, so close. At the same gym where I used to work out all the time, there was this lady, she was in her like, mid thirties, I guess at this time. And man, let me tell you, she just put her chest flat on the ground. Both toes, right? Like, you, you imagine sitting down and trying to, you know, reach out, you know, do this thing here, that thing there, chest flat on the ground, no effort. Her daughter comes in and starts working out with us too. And at first, like, she lacks flexibility. But after like two weeks, chest to the ground. How? Genetics, right? Totally genetics built into the concept of this ligamentation. And it's reality. Some folks' ligaments are just tighter than others. This person here has incredibly loose ligamentation. I have very tight ligamentation, let's say. The side effect of that is my joints would be very stable, but I lack flexibility. Question? Do kids have loose ligaments? That's an interesting question. Because when I was younger, I actually dislocated my elbow because yeah. we were playing Ring Around the Rosie and my grandfather like picked me up by my hand. Yep. Yeah. Pop right out. Do a little review on that. Because I know like little kids are more flexible than our adults. We all know this, yes? Mm -hmm. I believe that. Because my like cognitively, I would think that kids would have tighter ligaments because they're growing. So the ligaments would be tighter because they're stretched more taut. I bet I gotta do some reading. So keep curiosity. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, let's do muscle tone, because we're running a long time. Muscle tone. Uh, the more tone you have in your muscles, the uh, more stability you have. The less tone you have, the more loose your joints are. Uh, 
Uh, we can think about like opposite ends of the spectrum here. Never ever tell my wife about this. Uh, my wife's shoulders pop out of joint sometimes. Okay, not lately, but sometimes. Uh, and I was like, you should go to a doctor and get this looked at. Maybe you got some sort of issue. You complain about it all the freaking time. Now, yeah, go get checked. You know, no big deal. So she goes and they're like, oh yeah, we can totally take care of that. I'm gonna set you up with some uh, physical therapy and they're gonna build up your shoulder muscles a little bit. You're gonna have no more problems with joint dislocations. And she was like, <laughs> no, no. not going to, no, no, not doing that. Uh, <clears throat> that is to say that she has kind of loose-ish ligaments in her shoulders. And if she worked out her shoulder muscles and got more muscle tone in her shoulders, it would pull things together and she'd have no more issues. Extreme example of this. You ever watched a real hardcore bodybuilder mm -hmm. walking around? They're like, mm -hmm. why are they so stiff? Because they got so much muscle tone that their joints wax. The, or, I'm sorry, they're so freaking stable that they lack any range of motion. Or alternatively, yeah, this is my favorite. You see folks bust up in the gym, go to the gym, walk in, here we go. Then they leave the gym like this. <laughs> you seen it? I've seen it. Just walk out just like that. Kathy, is it all in their head? No. Oh, no, no, they do that. You build a little bit of extra muscle tone. Okay, just like if you were to start playing guitar and your, your fingers tips, fingers tips, fingertips, there we go, toughen with playing the guitar, yes. Just like if we all just went and laid outside all day long for like, you know, three hours a day, our, our skin's tone would darken from melanin production. You go and you work out, your muscles will enlarge and develop tonus as a protective measure. Same concept, same concept. And as a side effect of that excess muscle tone, the joints become more stable. You lose a little bit of flexibility. It's reality. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll do. Range of motion and joint stability. This is really important, really important. Oh boy, how deep there down we this go. rabbit hole do I feel like a... What do we have, 15 minutes? Give me a second. Yeah, this is not hard. This is all easy stuff. All right, I'm gonna lay it all on you, you ready? Keep it simple. Uh, there are plane joints, hinge joints, and pivot joints. Plane joints are glidey motions, they don't rotate. They, they, they just kinda move past one another. Your carpals are classic plane joints. Like I can sit here and restrain my wrist and I can kind of get a little wiggly wiggle go in here. All right, that's the plane joints and your carpals just kind of doing this. They, they glide past you, gliding. But yeah, that'll do. Uh, I thought I was misinterpreted my terms here. There is hinge joints. Take a wild guess what a hinge, jo a hinge joint does. It, moves. it opens it closes. and it closes. Like your elbow. Watch what I can do. That's it. It's a hinge joint. All right. Look at the end of my finger here. It's a hinge joint. Okay. They're hinge joints. They rotate in one axis. Let's do that. Real simple. Real simple. Hinge joint. Then there are pivot joints. Where do we find pivot joints? Yeah, man. Your neck, radius and the ulna. Now, here, I've got two bones that come together and they kind of move past one another. In the radius and the ulna, it's a true twisting, turning motion. It pivots, as it were, twists on a single point. Okay, a real twisting, if you will. Like, this is not this. The shape of the joints are very different. All right, here we got these deep concavities. Here it's just a round structure. A uh, round end of one bone fit into the bones or ligament sleeve, has a ligamental sleeve associated with another twisting motion. Seen in the radio ulnar joints in your elbows, and seen in your um, etnatoaxial joints. Which is much linear, much linear. Condyloid joints have a condyle. Condyles are rounded projections fitting into a little cavity. Condyloid joints move in multiple axes. Like, look at this. So, all right, look up here. That is a hinge joint, one axis of movement. Do we agree? But back here, you've got these round ends of the bone fitting into a related end. 
So what I can do back here in this convoluted joint is I can go like this. I can also do this. I can say no, but I can also ask you to come this way. Does that make sense? So it's multiple axes, more than one axis. Yeah. So condylar joints and pivot joints are very, very, very similar. It's just that condyloid joints you can... Think about the pivot joint down here. Pivot joint, you have this sleeve of connective tissue that allows for rotation. In a condyloid joint, you get this round end that fits into a cup, and it can go backwards, forward, left, or right. Does that spin? No I spinning. I no see. Spinning. Okay. This is spinning. This is not spinning. But that, um, the, what am I trying to say? The, the strange, the way that they're built, the way that they are built is similar. If that's how you want to think about it, feel yes. free. That's what I got to say to you. Okay, cool. So for me, this one's, oh, hang on. Ah! Sorry. <clears throat> for me, this spins. This just goes forward, backwards, right, and left. Got it. Uh, saddle joints are pretty much identical to a condyloid joint. The difference is the shape of the articulating surface. It looks like a saddle. You know, it's a saddle joint. The only place you see this is in your thumbs. Your thumbs are the classic saddle joints. So, like up here, that's a conduit joint. They're round. They do the same thing as your thumb does. Your thumb is just shaped like a saddle, so it's a saddle joint. Uh, and then last but not least is the classic big ball and socket. You have a virtually flat area with a big ball on one end. A sphere on the head of one bone fits into a socket of another highly movable. Your shoulder and your hip are involved in this. So I can take my leg and I can go in and out and forwards and backwards. Same thing with my shoulder. Okay. Full rotational movement, classic ball and socket. So what happens if your arm gets pulled out of your socket? Can't hear you. What happens if your like, arm gets pulled out of your socket? Pretty bad. I can, uh, anybody know who Bo Jackson is? Probably, mm -hmm. probably top 10 best athletes I can think of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bo was famous in the 80s, man, and early 90s, but Bo Jackson was like the athlete. Like, Bo Jackson was a pro football player, and then in the off season, he was a pro baseball player, simultaneously. Freaking Bo Jackson, come on. Like, for those of you that didn't grow up in the 80s and 90s, like, there were all these commercials. Bono. They'd be like, do what? Bono. 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 Yeah, we had to be like, Bono's baseball, home run. He's running, he makes a touchdown, he goes, oh, those football. And I don't remember what they were for, but they were great. They're classic commercials. Like, there's this great uh, video of Bo Jackson running. He's playing for the Kansas City Royals baseball. And he's running, and he's just like a laser beam, man, super fast. And he goes, and he sees this ball going up, about to be a home run, and he just, no, 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 he catches the ball. He catches the ball, and then the fence is right in front of him. So he just runs up the fence, comes back around the other side, and lands on the ground. And everybody in the crowd is like, guy's amazing or like another classic moment swing strikes out takes his bat breaks it <laughs> <laughs> this guy's legs were like tree stumps it was amazing all right <clears throat> oh so the reason we're talking about Bo Jackson is because he was playing football one of the best there was at the time he was playing for uh, Oakland Raiders at that time I mean just terrifying nobody wanted to hit Bo Jackson so he's running and this guy dives and grabs him by a leg and he just yanks his leg out of the guy's hand. And when he does, he tears his hip out of socket. And nobody knew. Nobody knew. And it caused this big, you know, blood clotting issue in his thigh. And so all the bone and all the cartilage just died. Just killed it all. So he had to have a complete hip replacement. Never the same. No. What a shame. What a shame. He would have been a Hall of Famer, baseball and football. But uh, never really played again. All right, gliding movements, angular movements. How deep do I want to go? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna work, and then we're gonna take a break, and we'll come back in the lab, we're gonna finish this up, because it's all the same stuff we're doing in the lab. Is that a deal? Yes. I'm just gonna take my time. What if we don't finish up now, we'll just finish it up in the lab. Heck, I might take pity on you and have you do an online quiz instead of a face-to-face -face one. I bet you'd love that. But study for the face-to-face, because -face, I might just do that instead. So study for the face-to-face. -face. We'll talk. We're going to chat. I'm going to make you some time up. Ah, gliding movements. Flat bones gliding past one another. This is the classic plane joint. They have gliding motions, as you can imagine. The bones just kind of glide past one another. Angular movements. Now, this is why I want to talk about this. Flexion and extension. To flex decreases the angle between two bones in a joint. All right? Decreases the angle. That's flexion. 
whereas this would be extension. extension. And if I wanted to, I could give it a little extra, and that would be considered hyperextension. Hyperextension, good. Uh, rotational motion. Rotate here a little bit if I want to. The better terms here are supination and pronation. Pronation and supination, special movements. All right, watch me. If I'm standing in an anatomical position, and I rotate my thumbs down, that is pronation. If I've got my thumbs down and I rotate my palms up, that is supination. The classic way to remember this, this is my PT folks back in the day, all right? Uh, they'd be like, if you want to supinate, you're just like you're asking for soup. Can I have some more soup? That is supination, rotate the thumbs outwards like so. Uh, so it's supination, pronation, by comparison. Uh, do I want dorsiflexion? Uh, all right, let's just leave it right there. Let's leave it right there. And the reason I'm telling you this is as follows. You will use, I'm not done, I'm not done. What's next? Maybe we will stop here. All right, let's not, just, just pay attention. The reason I want to tell you a little bit, where's abduction and abduction? Have we already done that? Do you see that in here anywhere? Am I crazy? I guess it's just right there. Did I skip it? Well, Jack, um, let's talk about abduction and adduction. That's important. Pronation and supination is important, as is adduction and abduction. So listen up. Let's do adduction and abduction. Uh, adduction, my arms are straight. Adduction is to bring them down closer to the body, okay? To adduct. Uh, so if my leg's out like this, I can adduct by bringing it back down straight closer to a center line in the body. Uh, adduction means to add your extremities back to your system. Is that fair? Yes. As opposed to abduction, abduction would be like raising my arms up, increasing the angle between my body and, and the extremities. Like that would be abduction. Um, my old hardcore anatomy professor, she would say if you're being abducted by aliens and you're like in the particle ring raising up, you're like, okay, that's abduction. Uh, the reason I'm telling you about these terms is as follows. We use these when we're judging general joint health so imagine you're a healthcare provider and you got somebody with like a rheumatoid arthritis. You'll have them come in and be like, all right, I want you to rotate your thumb around and down as far as you can. And you check that angle. And you have them rotate it the opposing direction as far as they can. And you check that angle. So you're having them max pronate, max supinate. And that'll allow you over time to judge the health of their joints with this disorder. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Like you could have them raise their arms up as high as they can raise them up, okay? Abduction, and then have them put them down as far as they can put them down, adduction. And use that over time to measure general joint stability, joint health, joint health. Does this make sense? So you're gonna be seeing this. It's coming, prepare yourself, you're gonna see it. Uh, so we use this again in a clinical setting to measure general joint health. All right, is that good? Now again, I'm going to finish this sucker up in class. Yeah. Then we're going to talk about what we're going to do next.